Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12. This is the last uh, Sunday of February. Um, we're going to be into March here in just a few days. Don't forget, if you have a watch like mine uh, that has a calendar on it that you need to wind ahead, you know, I'm, I'm kind of old school when it comes to that. Don't forget that. Um, but uh, And also, don't forget the time change is coming up, so you have to wind your watch a little bit, uh, a little bit more. So uh, don't forget those things. Um, I want to preach a message to you about love that I have entitled Extravagant Love. Out of John chapter 12, how many of you, what do you think of when you think of the word extravagant? Have you ever had anything that was extravagant? It's, it's very costly. Um, Jonathan, I, I had to take Jonathan to work uh, one day last week because his, what was that? Somebody said something. Oh, just, okay. Okay, I must be here, th- I don't know, but... Uh, uh, anyway, uh, maybe it was one of those extravagant things. I don't know. But I had to take Jonathan to work one day uh, last week. His uh, truck is in the shop and so on. And we went uh, kind of the back way to his work and so on. And he said, Dad, you got to look at this. You got to look at this house up here. He said, this is the biggest house I've ever seen in my life. And I thought, well, you have been to Biltmore House in uh, outside Asheville, North Carolina, so maybe it's um, number two on the list. <laughs> but it was huge. I have no idea how big it was. He didn't know anything about the square footage, but it, it was a castle for sure. A uh, very nice piece of property and so on. And, um, you, you know, you think about building a house uh, of, let's say, Biltmore House magnitude. How many of you have ever been there? A few of you been there? Okay. I've never been there, although I lived within just a couple hours of there, but I know a lot of people have, and they see all of the, the, the building itself, the house itself, the grounds, and all of that, and you think about the fact that that is, is yeah, that's pretty extravagant, isn't it? Especially to have been built back in the day when it was built. It's still very extravagant. You think of castles and all of the, um, the decorations and all of that. We often think of those things, but the word actually means, extravagant actually means exceeding the limits of reason or necessity. Okay. Now, uh, again, consider that for just a second. Something extravagant exceeds the limits of reason. It's unreasonable. Nobody would do something like that, but people certainly do. Uh, you could think of that in this way. How many of you have ever heard of a product that is advertised on TV, and they've got so many thousand five-star reviews, and it is, you know, I, I mean, it's the best thing that's ever been, and they make all these claims. How many have ever bought something based on some extravagant claim? Um, Some people have, I'm sure. Um, But it also means, it can mean lacking in moderation or balance and restraint. How many of you have ever seen somebody, uh, when their, their ball team wins at the last, I mean, it's a buzzer beater kind of thing, and their exaltation, their glee is ju- it just ongoing. It's like, okay, it's a ball game, man. Get over it, you know. No, they're you know four or five days into it, and they're still celebrating something like that. Uh, it means also spending much more than necessary. How many have ever done that? Have you uh, have you filled your car? Um, with gasoline recently, um, you know, is it really necessary for gas to be as high as it is? Well, well there are all kinds of other things that you can think of that are extravagant. Uh, in my own personal life, uh, my mother and I, 
uh, went about my father's, I think it was my dad's um, 60th birthday, somewhere thereabouts. And I had been in the mall in Greenville. Teresa and I lived there for several years after we were married. And I saw this painting. And if you've been in my home, you too have seen it. It's right there at the bottom of our stairs when you come into the landing, the upper landing of our home, uh, that, that painting right there uh, of a, a civilian uh, at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, that particular painting is called Reflections. The gentleman that is featured in it in civilian dress, his name is Lee Teeter. He actually did the painting. And it's very striking. The first time I saw it, I was like, I got to get that for my dad. And then I looked at the price tag. <laughs> and I worked on a golf course at that time. So that was way beyond my, um, you know, even extravagance that I might have wanted to uh, bless my father with for his birthday. I took my mother when she was visiting with us and I said, we got to go to the mall. And my dad says, well, I'll come with you. And I said, no, you won't. <laughs> well, I like going to the mall. I like, and he started naming off stores and different stuff. And I said, no, mom and I, we got this little errand we need to do. Okay. So we went in this store and back in, that would have been 1992-ish. This painting was close to $700. And I asked the gal, the only one they had was the one on display. And I thought, can we get another print? And she said, no, it's the only one we have. If you want it, I can maybe take off a little bit, but this is how much it's going to be. And I heard my mother unzip her purse. And a piece of plastic went snapping down on the counter. And I said, Mom, she goes, we're getting it. And it was one of those treasures that my father kept until the day he died. Now it's mine. And I realized that maybe for some, $700 may not be much. But for us, it was pretty extravagant. It really was. I want us to look at this passage of scripture in John chapter 12 and notice as we're confronted with one woman's extravagant love for the Lord. Let's read in John chapter 12, beginning of verse number one. John writes, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, now you might underline this phrase if you're in the habit of underlining in your Bibles, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, underlined this phrase as well, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also whom he had raised from the dead. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have now to look into your word and we would pray, Father, that you would just open our understanding, open our eyes spiritually that we might see, open our hearts that we might accept what you want us to, to hear, and help us as well, Lord, just to go from this place changed. 
Help us to understand that your love for us was, in fact, extravagant. As we look at it, it doesn't, it, and it didn't, it didn't make sense. It seems to be unreasonable. It seems to certainly exceed the limits of our understanding. Why would a holy God die on behalf of sinful creatures such as we are? And that certainly is the height of extravagance. To be willing to give up everything that our Savior gave up, to endure everything that he endured, because he loves us, is beyond compare, is beyond explanation. We don't fully understand it, and again, as has already been mentioned in this service, we won't fully understand it until we get to heaven. But until that time, Lord, may we just simply praise you and thank you by giving our lives lovingly, obediently, without reservation, to serve you, to point others to Christ before it's eternally too late. We pray you'd remove any of the distractions that have come our way. Help us to focus our attention upon your word. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Exceeding the limits of reason or necessity. Lacking in moderation. Spending much more than necessary. We have in this passage of scripture, which I confess is one of my favorite. Uh, an example of that very extravagant love that we're talking about. But I want you to understand that extravagant love is often the result of a life-changing circumstance. Um, Look at John chapter 11, maybe right just across the page there. And it says in verse number one, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Then Jesus heard, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that he saith unto his disciples, Let us go unto Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things saith he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, not, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then Jesus says unto them very plainly, what? Lazarus is dead. We know from the account as well, verse number 39 says that he was been dead four days by the time Jesus got there. And he told his disciples very plainly because they misunderstood that Lazarus was in fact dead. And they thought, well, if he's sleeping, that's probably a good thing. But notice, if you will, verse 21. Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Look down at verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now Mary and Martha both 
thought Jesus should have come to heal Lazarus before he died. Why did he wait? He waited to show his disciples and Mary and Martha and Lazarus and by extension us as well today his glory. What's easier, to heal a person of an illness or raise them from the dead? I should put it this way, what's harder, to heal a person from an illness or to raise them from the dead? Which is it? The latter, to raise them from the dead. Because nobody, no doctor, as great as he may be, as educated as he may be, as wonderful as he may be, has ever done that. There's only one person that has ever done that. Now, I realized many years ago there was an evangelist who I don't even know if he's in the ministry anymore. I know that uh, he was at one time uh, very prominent in the, the, the um faith healing movement, the name it, claim it kind of thing. You know, you just talk to your checkbook if you're having trouble with your bills and you want some more money in there, you just talk to your checkbook and you say, you great, wonderful checkbook, you, you've never had so much money in you before in your life. And the day after that, poof, you go in there and, all, you know, he was one of those prominent speakers, I'll not call his name. He supposedly raised somebody from the dead. He claimed it for years. And if I remember the report that I read years ago after the fact that exposed him for what he was, a charlatan, the person that was actually raised from the dead, their family said, no, he was never dead. There's only been one person that has ever done that. And we're reading about an incident where he did that. Now, let me ask this question. Would that change your perspective just a little bit? You name a loved one that you have laid to rest. How wonderful would it be? And maybe just a little spooky, possibly. If they showed up tomorrow in your living room in perfect health. After you got up off the floor, you would probably be pretty extravagant in your praise, I would think. Would you not? Well, this event took place literally, not figuratively. Jesus mentions, John mentions that Lazarus was in fact dead. An extravagant love, the product of this life-changing circumstance, that's what caused it. The fact that Lazarus is no longer dead. Notice again, if you and think about this, it's not mentioned in this account, but Matthew 26 and Mark chapter 14, they give Matthew and Mark's account of this. In this, their particular account, it mentions that this took place in Simon's house. Okay, Simon the leper, which indicates something. Because back then, leprosy... And I don't know that even today that leprosy, there's certain forms of leprosy that have no cure, as far as I know. Leprosy was always fatal back in the first century. And before that, and maybe even today, if you get leprosy, there's no change in it. Do you think if you had a disease that ostracized you and separated you from everybody for the rest of your life and somebody cured you of that, 
do you think that would make a profound impact in your life? Certainly it would. There are people that, you know, we've had some on our prayer list who had cancer. We prayed for them. And guess what God was gracious and merciful enough to do? He cured them of whatever it was. This particular event, the fact that this supper that most probably, well, what kind of supper would you provide? What kind of supper would you put together? What kind of menu would you ladies come up with? How many courses would you put together at such an event? You, you think it would be pretty extravagant? Sure it would. It wouldn't be peanut butter and jelly and a glass of milk, right? Uh, it wouldn't be, uh, you know, cheese sandwich and a glass of water or something like that, right? It would be the best that you could find and beyond that and so forth, but Simon undoubtedly had a life-changing event. We know that Lazarus did. We know that Mary and Martha did. And to show their love for the Lord for what he did, what did they do? They lavished something on him. I want you to look over at John chapter 12 again, verse number 2. I made comment of it as we were reading. Those three little verses, or three little words in the verse there, about the middle of the verse, it says, and Martha served. Okay? That particular word in the Greek language means to serve to wait upon. How many of you have ever done that? Maybe it wasn't that you were a member of a wait staff, you weren't a waiter or a waitress in a restaurant, but you've served meals before. Or you have done something for somebody and taken care of their needs and so on. That's the idea. The emphasis is on the work to be done and not on the relationship. So something changed between and I want you to hold your finger in John 12 and find Luke chapter 10. Find Luke chapter 10. <coughs> this word in John chapter 12 and verse 2 says that Martha served... It means to bring advantage to others. It means to help. And when it is used, helping someone directly is involved. I'm going to serve you, specifically you. I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to make, hopefully, uh, make you happy. I'm going to do something for you personally, okay? There's a different word found in Luke chapter 10. Look at verse number 38. Luke 10, 38. It says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. This was again in Bethany. Okay. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived there. And it says in verse 39, And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to the Lord and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. The word that Martha uses is a different, it's similar, but it's different in Luke than it is in John chapter 12, and the significance is this. In Luke chapter 10, Martha is not interested in actually serving others. She is more interested in her sister serving her. 
help me. She's left me alone. I've got this, maybe in her mind, it was an extravagant meal. I've got these people. I've got, you know, they just kind of, how many of you ever had an uninvited guest show up? I can remember one time when we lived up in Monroe County, one of my father's brothers, my uncle, and his wife just showed up. We didn't have any idea they were coming. They just showed up. And we heard this car come up. I happened to look out one of the windows, and I said, wow, it's Uncle Robert, Aunt Sharon. And my wife went, what? Did you, did you call them and invite them? I said, no, they just, here they are. We, I went out the house and I said, hey, how's it going? You know, kind of wondering, okay, why are you here? And you didn't call and make reservations ahead of time, you know, six months in advance or anything like that. And um, they just simply said, well, we hadn't seen you in a while. We thought we'd come visit. They spent the night and the following morning, off they went back to Indiana. It's like, okay. How many of you have ever had that happen to you? This is kind of the idea that was going on in Luke chapter 10. But you have to understand something. Martha served in both circumstances. But after this life-changing event that's mentioned in John chapter 12, her serving changed. She was more willing to do for others, no matter the relationship, it didn't matter. She was just willing to lavish on others whatever they needed. There's a difference there between serving because I have somebody else to help me and serving whether you have somebody to help you or not. And it was generated, again, by this life-changing event that we've been looking at in John chapter 12. When Jesus says to Martha in Luke chapter 10, look at verse 41. He says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. It says in verse 41, she was cumbered about much serving. The idea, that Greek word, means to drag around. It means to distract with care. How many of you think that Martha was a good hostess? Think she would have been? Probably, okay? But she wore her hostess duties like a heavy weight. It was not necessarily something that she enjoyed doing. She took it as an obligation. She took it undoubtedly very seriously, but she dragged this thing around everywhere she went. In John chapter 12, It's different. Jesus says, Thou art careful and troubled about many things. It means, well, the one word means the inward fretting. You're careful, you're anxious. You know, isn't there a verse of scripture in the Bible that talks about being careful and anxious? Um, What's it say? Um, Be careful for some things that are really important to you. Um, Be anxious about things that are, um, again, very important, life-threatening kind of things. What's it say? Paul says, be careful for nothing, right? Well, that was not Martha in Luke chapter 10, but the other word that makes up this word picture, if you want to call it that, troubled and and careful about many things, 
is the anxiety of the overly, uh, overly elaborate preparation and the outward bustle of those preparations. How many of you have ever seen somebody, you know, maybe it is that you had one of those uninvited guests that showed up. I've seen it happen, as I mentioned, when my aunt and uncle came to our home. It's kind of like, okay, what are we going to fix them? What are we going to eat? What are we going to this? What are we going to that? Is the bedroom upstairs clean? You know, do we need to change the sheets and all that kind of stuff? What do we need to do? Do we need to, did you vacuum the, the house? Did you take out the trash? Did you this, that, and the other? You get really busy, right, about those kind of things. And that's the idea. She was cumbered about. She fretted. She was anxious. She was overly careful. She carried this weight with her, and it basically just dragged her down emotionally. But again, things changed in John chapter 12, if you go there again. I want to ask this question as well in regard to our own life-changing circumstances. Let me go to Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> Let me read the first nine verses. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you hath he quickened, that means to make alive, okay, who were, now notice, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He's talking about before your salvation. He's talking about before you trusted Christ, what were you? You were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, <coughs> me, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or our lifestyle in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the deeds of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Verse number four starts with two wonderful words. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his, this kindness, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now think about that for just a second. If you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you were just kind of like Lazarus. Lazarus physically, us spiritually, right? But what happened? When we came to know the Lord, we were born again. We were made alive spiritually. Is that a life-changing circumstance? Yes or no? And should there also be a change in our attitude and love for the Lord? And my question is to you this, this morning, <clears throat> what are you doing to lavish your love upon the Lord? Because if you've been changed, because you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, how long have you been changed? How long is that change going to last? Forever. You get eternal life. Never goes away, right? But extravagant love is often, again, the result of life-changing circumstances. If you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, your life has changed forever. And because of that, there ought to be some love for the Lord. Secondly, <clears throat> extravagant love is also a sign of intense devotion and delight in another. I'll not have you turn here, but Psalm 40, verse 8 
says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. The word delight means to feel a strong, positive attraction for something. How many of you have a hobby? Any of you have a hobby? Okay. What kind of hobbies do we have? What kind of hobby? You raised your hand back there. What kind of hobby do you have? Pardon me? She has a whole farm. Okay. That's, that sounds too much like work, actually, than a hobby, but uh, okay. It could. Okay. Right now she's got a baby lamb in her house. Okay. That's okay. That, again, that sounds too much like work. <laughs> if that's your hobby, then okay. But we have hobbies, right? Things that we're very passionate about, right? Um, There was a time in my life that golf was my passion. Golf was my hobby. I enjoyed it. If people that I met came up to me, we got to talking, somehow eventually the the conversation would go toward golf. You play golf? No, I don't. Okay, well, I'm done with you. I'll go find somebody else. Uh, Do you play golf? Yes, I do. What kind of golf clubs do you have? What kind of blah, 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 this, that, and the other. Uh, I've gotten away from that. I don't have that kind of hobby anymore. I have a different kind of hobby, okay, which involves a pistol range and different stuff like that. We'll not go into all those details, but I like talking about it. I like, I like doing that. I like participating in that, um, in, in exercising my Second Amendment, if you get my meaning. I'm passionate about that, okay? Whatever your hobby is, often you will spend a lot of time doing that, right? Even even time where you might be better served using your time in a different way. I mean, with golf, I was talking to somebody recently, and I said, you know, I kind of gave up golf. I might, I don't know if I'm going to get back into golf or not, but depends on whether that little girl in South Carolina, you know, comes to me and says, Papa. I want golf clubs for my birthday. It's like, okay, honey, what are you going to do with them? I'm going to learn to play golf. Can you teach me? Okay, maybe I can. But regardless of what your hobby is, and when we're talking about golf, how long does it take to go play golf? If you have that hobby, how, how many hours during the day are we talking about? If you decide, okay, Monday... You know, a lot of pastors, they have Monday off, okay? Take Monday off, go play golf. How long is that going to take you? It's going to generally take you four hours. That's the average, quote-unquote, average length of of a round of golf to get around all 18 holes, okay? That's just four hours of play if you're average, Most of us are far below average, which means that that four hours turns into more than that. Maybe, hopefully not eight, but okay. I read of a a couple of Japanese businessmen years ago who were visiting in the United States, and they went to this particular golf course because the, the, the golf pro there was very famous. They wanted to meet him. They wanted to play on his golf course because he was also the superintendent. Superintendent, golf pro says, how do you play? What's your handicap? Oh, we're scratch golfers. We, you know, it takes us 72 strokes to get around 18 holes. Okay. <clears throat> 12 hours later, they were still on the golf course. They were way below average, okay? But you take into the, the account the, take into account the time, four hours or so, four hours, we like to say ish, right? The distance it takes you to get there and the distance it takes you to get back home, what have you just done? You have used an entire day, right? Okay. Um, And many people would say, you wasted it. But I would be willing to do that and have been willing to do that. I have been willing to get up before the, the cock crowed, right? 
and go out and, and, and drive someplace to chase this little white ball around and play golf. I have spent an inordinate amount of time doing that. I have spent an inordinate amount of time by myself in a tree stand 25 feet off the ground just waiting for the elusive white-tailed deer. Odeocolis virginianus. And I'm not talking about one that's smooth on her head. I'm talking about one that's, you know, we're going we're gonna to hang him on the wall, right? And people look at that and they go, man, that is crazy. No, not for me. Not for you. If you have whatever hobby it happens to be, you delight to do that. You feel a strong, positive attraction for that. <clears throat> When you go to the grocery store, you go to Hobby Lobby or wherever you happen to go, you are drawn into that section and so on. It also means to like someone or something very, very, (coughs) excuse me, David, could you give me some water, please? Very, very much. How many of you have ever heard junior high children say in their little groups at lunch, so? You like so-and-so. Well, yeah, I I like them. Okay, do you like them like them, or do you like like them? Thank you. Do you like them like them? You know what I'm talking about? If it's just a one like, it's kind of like, yeah, we're we're friends. We're in the same class. She rides my bus. I ride their bus, whatever it is, and uh, so forth. But but if, if it's more than that, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? You know what we're talking about because you've been there, right? You delight in them. When you see them, could be a rainy day, could be a terrible day, could be a horrible, no good, very bad day. And you see them, and what happens to the frown? It gets turned upside down, and things are great, right? Why is that? It's because... You take delight in them. We enjoyed that time with our granddaughter this last week. And when we first got there and saw her Sunday or Monday morning, because we got there a little late. Oh, we did see her Sunday night, right? Yeah, we pushed. I'm telling you, we had she goes to bed at 830. We, We drove through, you know through the miles is about as fast as we could go that was reasonable and got there about half an hour before bedtime. And, and uh, we're like, oh, Alice, you know, come see Mama, come see Papa, come see. And she's looking at us like not on your life, man. <laughs> it wasn't quite the stink eye, you know what I'm saying? But she was looking at us like, nah, nope, 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 nope. Later in the week, we go someplace, come back in the house, And guess who's standing there looking through the window? Why is that? Seems like she liked us very, very much. Now, Teresa and I were talking on the way here yesterday. You wonder, she said, do you wonder if you think she'll miss us today? She's 15 months old. I don't know. She probably doesn't miss much of anything unless it's a pacifier, right? She's only got four of them. But extravagant love is a sign of intense devotion and delight in another. The verse in Psalms that I read to you, verse, uh, Psalm 40 and verse number 8 says, I delight to do thy will. Question. Do you love the Lord that much? When he says something, you are delighted to do it. Extravagant love also is blatantly unselfish. It takes no thought of cost. As I mentioned, my mom, that painting 
It's actually a print. It's not an original painting. I can't imagine what the original painting is, is valued at, but that particular print back in the early 90s was pretty expensive. <clears throat> My mother, like I said, she snapped down that credit card, and she says, we're getting it. I don't care how much it costs. Okay. <clears throat> Notice if you go back to John chapter 12. It's interesting to me, and we're not told. In verse number four, it says, And one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Was this the Simon in whose house this meal was prepared? We don't know. But if it was, <clears throat> what does it say about Judas Iscariot? If his father had an incurable disease that was fatal and Jesus healed him, why wasn't Judas's life unalterably changed? Why didn't he love the Lord? Doesn't matter which Simon he was son of, but I've often thought about that if it took place in his father's home. But notice, if you will, <clears throat> where he says in verse number five, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? That was 300 days wages. OK, now you can figure it up how much, you know, when you were gainfully employed before you retired. How many or how, mu how much were you paid a day? Whatever your hourly wage is, multiplied times how many hours you worked a day, and so forth. And then you multiply that number times 300, okay? Let's just think about that for just a second. In 2023, now there's been a big uh, push over the course of several years to get the av or the the minimum wage to $15 an hour, okay? There are some states in the United States where they actually, the minimum wage is actually more than that, okay? <clears throat> but let's use 15 as our minimum wage. If you work 15 or make $15 an hour times an eight-hour work day, Okay? Now, a lot of folks are 12 hours. My wife's 12 hours and so forth and so on. Okay? Times 300 days. You can do the math. That comes up to $36,000. Okay? Now, notice what he says. <clears throat> In verse number three, it says, Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. And what did she do with it? To begin with, the alabaster box that it was in by itself would have been very expensive. How many of you have ever seen a Ming vase? You know what I'm talking about? A Ming vase? The Ming dynasty in China? It's, I don't know how old that is, but how far that goes back. But there are Ming vases out there that you can you probably look at but not touch. You go to the Smithsonian Institute. And, uh, you know, some place that's got a, a museum or something like that. And, and uh, you come in contact with one of those things and you bump into the pedestal that's on and you smash that thing on the floor. You, you, you're going to be in deep, serious trouble. But because of its value, you're probably not going to be able to get to it. But this particular box was very expensive by itself, but it contained something that was more valuable. This Pistic nard, as it's called, very costly. And what did he do? What did, what did Mary do with it? She just poured it out. She didn't do a, you know, uh, Brill Cream used to talk about a little dabble, do you? She didn't just go, oh. She didn't do that. What did she do? She broke the box so it could not be refilled, it could not be reused. And she poured the contents of that box, that alabaster box, on the head of our Savior. She didn't care how much it cost her. 
Now again, <clears throat> extravagant love is blatantly unselfish. It doesn't care what the cost is. I don't care. This person I love and I'm going to do this for them. Period. End of discussion. I don't care. I don't care if I have to work overtime from now until the day I die to pay for it. It's worth it. I don't care if when I give this up, I never get it back. This to me is priceless, but the one I am bestowing it on is even more priceless. Extravagant love <clears throat> takes no thought for cost nor criticism. When you step out and you decide because of his great love for us that I'm going to do something to prove my great love for the Lord and people go, whoa, wait a minute. Do you know how long it's going to take you? Do you know how long it's going to cost you? Do you know how much it's going to take for you to fulfill that? And you say, I don't care. What are they going to do? See, Judas, what did he do? He said it was a waste, wasn't it? Is it a waste for someone to spend their life Loving the Lord. Is it? It, it? Even even if it costs them. And we really don't have the concept of this here in America, but there are places in the world where our brothers and sisters in Christ, if, if, if they proclaim faith in Jesus, you know what it could and most probably will cost them? Their lives. And I'm not talking about we're going to pack them up and we're going to put them on a train somewhere. We're going to send them to Siberia to labor. I'm talking about we're going to take them out in the middle of a soccer field and we're going to put a bullet in the back of their head. It could very well cost them that much. And yet what do they do? They willingly give their lives. Now here in America... We don't know so much about that, but we can still, can we not, give our lives to the Lord regardless of what anybody says, regardless of what anybody thinks, regardless of what it costs us? One of the great things about this passage of Scripture, I think, <clears throat> can be found in John 12, verse number 3, the last part of this verse says, And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now you read through the Gospels and you will find out that not too long after this event, Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Simon's son. Everywhere he went, I would submit to you, even to the cross, he smelled like this ointment. Your love for the Lord, as extravagant as you can make it, is going to be noticed by other people. And you never know what that influence is going to, to be. You never know what that influence is going to produce in their lives. You never know what benefit, what outcome there will be if you decide to love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That's what we're talking about. 
It is the greatest commandment. And it certainly will involve extravagance. People won't understand it. They'll go, well, why do you go to church? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you pray? Why do you this? Why do you that? That seems like a waste of time. No, it's not. We love him because he first loved us. He lavished himself upon us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What can we do for him? Let's pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. We thank you for this testimony, Lord. We thank you for the fact that we have penned in the pages of your word this wonderful illustration of a love beyond compare. We know ultimately that even though Lazarus was raised from the dead, he died again. But I can imagine, Lord, having been resurrected the first time that facing his death later in his life held no terror. I'm sure that Martha learned a great lesson. She didn't drag serving around like a, a ball and chain. She did it out of love for you. Regardless of who she served, she probably served with a, a light heart and a smile on her face, not, not worrying about whether she had help or not. We know that Mary gave most probably the most costly things that she owned because to her you deserved it. And we thank you for their testimony. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to better understand the lavish love that you poured out on the cross. You shed your blood in payment for our sin. And we praise you and thank you for it. We ask that you would help us to live our lives from now until the day you come and take us home or when we pillow our head as Lazarus in sleep, that you would help us to love you extravagantly, no matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody thinks. May we point others to Christ, that they might come to know your love for them.